evening. Uh, welcome to the National Opera Center, friends here in the Opera Center, and many of our generous friends who are joining us via live stream. And I know there are many of you there across the country, so welcome. We're delighted to have you with us this evening for uh, an interview with Michelle Bradley, one of the most important rising singers in the opera world today. But you're all here uh, in support of our mentorship program for women administrators. And this is a program that's been going on for a number of years, and a number of you have been supportive of the program from the very inception of it. The design is to uh, bring really exceptionally promising uh, young women into the sphere of leadership at Opera America and in the opera field to give them mentorship for a year or more to help them take important professional steps forward. And we certainly can't take uh, credit for all of it, but the progress of these women has been absolutely fantastic. And I just want to cite three examples. Uh, Mary Birnbaum, who's from the class of 2021, has just been appointed as the general director of Opera Saratoga. Julia, Julia Nulamara, from the class of 2019, is completing her third season as the general director of Opera Columbus. And our special guest interviewer, Piper Gunnarsson, has just been promoted from executive director to general director of on-site opera. These are only a few examples of the really important professional steps that the women have taken, for, uh, taken forward in their careers. Uh, I will say we can't take full credit for it, but the mentorship program certainly helps. And we're very, very grateful for your support of it for this coming season, and uh, we promise more very good results. Michelle Bradley is a graduate of the Lindemann Young Artist Development Program at the Metropolitan Opera. She's made debuts with the Met, with the San Francisco Opera, the Lyric Opera of Chicago, San Diego Opera, and abroad at one of my very favorite international companies, the Savonlina Opera Festival in Savonlina, Finland. So without any further ado, I'm delighted to turn the interview over to my good friend and colleague, Piper. Take it away. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mark. And thank you all for your support of the mentorship program. Um, and thank you, Michelle, for being here this evening with us and, and sharing some insights from your part of the field. Thank you. Um, very nice to meet you. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't kick things off with Mark Skorka's favorite question. Who took you to your first opera? Um, my first opera, I was introduced by Andrew W. Smith. He was my first voice teacher at Kentucky State University. I was 19 years old, or no, I was 17 when I started college. And he uh, showed me Turandot. It was on a VHS, <laughs> and he had this big system set up in his office. And he played it, and it was Turandot with Placido Domingo, and Leona Mitchell was Liu. And I fell in love with opera then. And I went to the library immediately after that and uh, took out the Touring Dot cassette tapes. I can't remember who the singers were, but it was back when we had Walkmans and I walked around with that, listening to it all day, every day. And I had really long hair so I could hide my uh, earphones under my hair and I'd sit and listen to it in class. I was a wonderful student. But <laughs> it was Andrew Smith. And he made me believe that not only did he help me fall in love with opera, he made me believe that I could do it as well. He told me I had the voice for it, and I believed him. That's fantastic. <laughs> now, that's so interesting. So your first opera experience was on a VHS. Yep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Shows so, how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both. Um, so what was your first experience going to an opera house? It was with Mr. Smith as well. It was um, Zalame at Louisville Opera. Mm -hmm. It was Zalame. And I remember it was my first experience, like going out. We, we got all dressed up. It was myself and other students. He took us to this really nice restaurant and things that I had never experienced before. And then we went to the opera. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't remember who was singing it or anything, but it was Zalame. That's and fantastic. at the end, of course, the dance of the seven veils and seeing her. And it was very tasteful. I think she ended up in like a bikini or something. But still, I was the music. I had never heard anything like that before. 
So I, I owe Mr. Smith a lot. He's no longer with us, unfortunately, but I owe him a lot as to where I am now. It sounds like he was a very pivotal figure in, in your journey. Very much like a, like a dad. It's mm -hmm. wonderful. Um, did you, do you remember what your initial impressions were of those two first operas? And has your uh, impression of them shifted at all over time as you've gotten to know the work better? Um, it, was, it wasn't necessarily those two operas, if I may be honest. I mean, I was mesmerized. Yes, I loved the music because I'd never heard anything like that before. I'm a church girl, so all I heard was gospel. And maybe once in a while my parents would have, you know, played some Motown or soul music. But, you know, that was really all that I was exposed to and, you know, R&B. But um, when Mr. Smith uh, also introduced me to Leontine Price, he had a wonderful picture of her in his office and I, I'd go for my voice lessons and I didn't know who this woman was, but it was a picture where like her eyes were always staring at me and I was like, who is this? And I finally, and she had this big old, you know, wonderful boa constrictor fur thing around her neck. You know, it was one of those great diva pictures mm -hmm. and she was just like, like that and just looking right at you. And I finally asked him, who is that? And he told me who it was and he gave me her prima donna album and I took it and listened to that. And that's when I said, like, this is where my voice belongs. I, those words verbatim, this is where my voice belongs. This is what I can do. And I don't know, you know, it just, that's the first thought that came to me. Because growing up singing in church, it was expected of me, I guess, that I would just sing gospel and hymns the rest of my life or as my older brother makes fun of me and say, I'd marry some old jack leg preacher, you know, just marry some guy. And, you know, we'd start this little church up somewhere and just save souls all over Kentucky. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, you know, I, I really didn't think I'd go any further than that, honestly. But when I heard her, it was like I knew that I could do it. And um, that's, that's what I started pursuing. I didn't know where it would take me. I knew that I wouldn't fit in as a gospel singer. I knew I wasn't a pop singer. I knew I wasn't a Beyonce or Whitney Houston. I just knew that I, I can't dance and I don't have that type of stuff. But I knew that I could stand up there and sing the things that I heard her do. So, And Mr. Smith, he just put me on the path to do it. Sorry for that long-winded. <laughs> That's what we're here for. We want to hear it all. So, Mr. Smith was, was a professor of yours in college. Kentucky State University. Mm -hmm. And you were studying voice at the yes. time? Yes. Uh, so what led you to study voice if you didn't, hadn't yet found opera? What were you thinking that your career might look like? I didn't even know the word career, to be honest. I'm sorry, y'all. I didn't. Um, Who I come, does at 17? <laughs> that too. I come from a family of workers. My people work hard. Everybody has a job or two jobs and we get up and go to work, and that's what I knew I was gonna do. If it was something I wanted, I was gonna have to go get a job so I can get it. You know, if it was somewhere I wanted to make it to, I'm gonna get a job so I can get it. Now, yes, I had the privilege of being the only girl out of three boys, and my, my daddy would help me. You know, I was the princess, if you will. But still, a princess had to get up and go to work too. Um, so I never thought about career, and funny enough, uh, my social studies teacher was the one that told me, you know what, you should go to this school and you should, you know, maybe try to study voice, study music. You know, it was her and the soccer coach. My social studies teacher was uh, Terry Morford and the soccer coach was Andrea Brown. People that knew my family, you know, I come from a tight-knit community in Woodford County, Kentucky, so everybody knew each other. But they were the two that said, you know, girl, we've been listening to you sing through church all your life and sing, I'd sing at all the pep rallies at school, the soccer games, football, bat, whatever. Any big event, national anthem called me. And um, she said, you know, you can really do more with this. I didn't know that. And my parents, they, they did the best they could with me and my brothers. And they just told us if it's something you wanna do, you work hard. They gave me the work ethic, they just didn't know the path. So Miss Morford and Andrea Brown, they taught me the path. Like, let's try and apply to Kentucky State University. Let's take the SATs, let's do all this stuff that I wasn't trying to do. And 
I got an audition. I got a choir scholarship with Carl Smith, Dr. Carl H. Smith. He was over the Kentucky State University Concert Choir. I got in there and mind you, I just knew how to hear music. I played piano by ear. I taught myself piano. I just listened to things. I, I would listen to Aretha Franklin, Whitney Houston, Mariah Carey, the Clark Sisters, um, James Cleveland. I mean, a lot of just different things. Stevie Wonder, and I would just imitate. That's how I learned. But when I got to Kentucky State and figured out, oh no, I, I have to learn how to read music. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and the first, the first day of school, we had a choir rehearsal and they put this sheet music in front of me and I know I looked up and everybody just started singing because they were from schools where they taught music like that. I just learned by ear. So I had, I think I'm probably talking too much or going off the question, but I had, um, I ended up teaching myself how to read music basically. But it was Miss Morford, my social studies teacher that told me, you know, go to college, get a degree in music. And then it just kept going from there. This is such an interesting and unexpected collection of <laughs> mentors and champions that had your back at that mm -hmm. young age. I mean, I, I don't know that very many people would think of the social studies teacher or the soccer coach as being the, the folks who would push them forward towards an arts career. Mm -hmm. That's really incredible. Um, you've mentioned some of your artistic inspirations as well. Can you tell us a bit more about who those singers that you really just fell in love with and inspired you and what was your your journey like finding your own voice alongside learning theirs? My first love in singing was Whitney Houston. And I mean, I was of that generation. I remember when The Bodyguard came out. I remember all the songs, how will I know, all of that. Yeah. And I would try my best to sound like her, um, Mariah Carey, Aretha Franklin too, you know, I tried my best. And um, I've said this in other interviews before, I really did sing in my closet when I was growing up. I was very shy and at school, I didn't really fit in with anyone. So coming home from school, I'd have to do my chores. And then I would sing in the closet until my parents got off work. And then I'd just, phew, I'd just be quiet for the rest of the time. But I was really trying to sound like them. Um, they, they were my first inspirations and it was just really Whitney Houston was number one for me. Still is, honestly, just the beauty, her character, her voice, her face, the performances she gives. She just poured out everything, every time, no matter what. And even later in her career, you know, some people want to give her a hard time. That's what greatness is is that you done gave so much of yourself that even when you don't have anything else to give, you still get out there and give something. You know, people want to down Maria Collis, but she still, she'd make you cry even when her voice was cracking. You know, I'm sorry, I'm getting off subject. But no, no. that was one of my great inspirations. When I got introduced to opera, it was Leontine Price mm -hmm. all the way. Because when I heard that Prima Donna album, and one of the first songs I remember hearing was Dupuis Le Jour, and I just, it was like a wave of, of music just kept coming over me. I remember I was in the cafeteria at K-State, and I was just sitting there listening to it, eating my little lunch and stuff. And I just went through that whole album and just kept it on me too. And that was, yet again, we had the portable CD players, I could hide the headphones. I just walk around campus listening to her. And that was my first inspiration. But as I got more and more into opera, it was um, Martina Arroyo and uh, uh, Maria Callas, you know, um, Aprile Milo, uh, Deborah Voigt, you know. And then to get all the way to the Lindemann program and actually meet some of these folks that I'd been listening to and studying and never in a million years would I think I'd meet them or hear them or have coachings with them or they'd even talk to me, you know. So that was a whole nother thing right there. Sorry, I'm... I'm no, this, I'm, is, this is fantastic. <laughs> I'm loving learning about all of this. Um, what was your first opera role? Uh, very first opera role was at Kentucky State University. Uh, it 
was Cosi Fan Tutte. I was Fior di Ligi, but we did it in English. But y'all, I was so proud of myself. I had learned it by myself. I knew how to read music by then. And I was, it was really, it gave me my first professional experience. Mr. Smith did that. He had a friend, uh, I can't remember his name. Oh gosh, forgive me. Dean, that's all we knew him by, Dean. But he had worked with Cincinnati Opera. He was an older gentleman. And he would come and coach us. And I didn't even know what coaching meant. I learned that during that time. You know, coaching means they correct you in your language and your production of tone and everything. And so I had all of that and I was able to catch on. And then we performed it and I remember it was uh, Courtney Cleveland and then Raymond Brown and Pumzil Soyola. He was a, a South American tenor. He was brought in from UK and the guys had these horrible wigs. And I mean, it was to the point that every time they did a move, the wig would shift and it'd be just something different and it would make me giggle and I'd have to try to stay in character while we did the opera. But it was just such a fun experience. I think that's when I really, really fell in love with it mm -hmm. because I not only did I just hear the music, but it was that I got to perform it mm -hmm. and I got to come out of my shell. I got to be an actress because Fior de Ligi, you know, she's the older sister and she's the more serious one and she gets mad and, you know, trying to, I guess, uh, press down her desires, which we know she really wants to go through with a lot of things, but she wants to be a lady about it. You know, she's in the most turmoil, but it, it was really, uh, I always look back at that. Even now with the operatic performances I've done, I want to have or want to keep that same joy I had when I did that. And I was 19 then. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I think for a lot of people in this industry that those early days had mm -hmm. such a profound impact on us and will always be a cherished moment for yes. us. Um, so you, you came into your college part of your career um, and had to kind of learn trial by fire a bit of learning how to read music and mm -hmm. I'm guessing also learning about the different languages involved in opera. Mm -hmm. um, did you find that other students in your program were at a similar place or did they already know some of these things? Um, how, how did you sort of find yourself within the atmosphere there? Honestly, I feel like I'm a late bloomer with everything. Um, even college, you know, uh, Kentucky State in Frankfort, Kentucky, they were bringing in students from like Detroit and Cleveland and places where they had schools that were like, um, uh, you know, music schools mm -hmm. where the focus was reading music and they had great choirs and things. I'm, I'm literally coming out of high school and the only training I had was Polk Memorial Baptist Church. So that I was behind. Even when I got to the Lindemann program, I was behind. I was, I know I was a little older than my colleagues and then they had already been to conservatories. They had studied languages, even at uh, K-State students, they, they knew of Italian and French and German. I really didn't know any of that. So I, I feel like I've always been playing catch up mm -hmm. through my whole career. Mm -hmm. I've had to, okay, the only way I'm gonna get this, I'm gonna have to work a little harder because I don't know what my colleagues know. Mm -hmm. I really don't. <laughs> so I, I had to, to work a little harder. So yes, I'm a, I consider myself a late bloomer and I'm still trying to catch up to everybody else. I think a lot of us are. <laughs> um, uh, so what, it, it sounds like maybe that is, has been a bit of a challenge, but what do you, what would you say have been some of the biggest challenges of turning that artistry that you found and developed as a singer into a professional career? I, I don't know if I ever thought of it that way. And I just know to get out there and sing and, and give of myself. That's really all I know how to do. And at that time, it's, it's everything I got. And it might be enough for you, it might not be, but it's, it's literally everything I got. Um, I don't know how, to, how else to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Y'all, you know, 
I learn the music and I get out there and I sing it to the best of my ability and trust and believe whenever I'm on that stage, that's everything. When I leave that stage, I am tired. <laughs> <laughs> I am tired. <laughs> That's great. And I think be between that and uh, what you were saying about sort of feeling like a late bloomer and, mm -hmm. and kind of playing catch up a little bit is such a testament to, of course, your work ethic, but also just your passion for, for what you do. What uh, are there composers or operas that you are particularly passionate about performing? Well, first off, anything I'm singing, I love it or even if I don't love it at first, I find a way to love it, like it, find something that compels me to it. You know, I, the Hermit songs are a staple in my recital rep. And when I first, I was given to them by, or they were given to me by Michael Heaston when I was still in the Lindemann program. And Valeria Polonino was my pianist. And I went to her and I was like, I can't sing this stuff. Because it was by Samuel Barber, it was contemporary music, and the the rhythms would be all over the place, and the pitches, and it was just like it was too much for me. But now that I've learned them, they're in me, and I sing them all the time. So um, anything I do, I find a way to love it. Um, but yes, Verdi is my number one guy. Anything by him. Um, it's not just Aida, it's Umbalo, La Forza del Destino, which I had the privilege to do in Frankfurt, Germany. I would love to do that again. Um, uh, Il Trovatore, another favorite of mine. And that was uh, one of the first operas I heard Leontine Price do as well. I mean, on YouTube, of course, I didn't hear in person. Um, <laughs> but then something that came as a surprise to me was um, Tosca. I've been singing a lot of her lately. I recently did her at Opera San Diego and also uh, debuted at the house and in the role at the Lyric Opera of Chicago. And she's become a character and the music that I've really fallen in love with, Puccini. And it's inspired me to try to tackle Madame Butterfly, Manon Lescaut, not just Liu, which I also did at the Met, but you know, to just delve into something different. And um, yeah, Puccini, um, Mozart, I do Don Anna. Uh, I'm learning Don Elvira. So just really stepping out of the box. But anybody that I'm working on, any composer, um, those guys I immediately love. But then other ones I, I just learned to fall in love with. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned that uh, Tosca came as a surprise to you. Mm. Why is that? I never thought I'd do that. I never thought I'd sing that role. Mm. First off, that's like the Maria Collis role. I wouldn't dare touch that. Not of my own accord. <laughs> but then when I found that my agent called me and he said, you're going to do it at Chicago Lyric Opera, you know, yeah, my heart went up in my throat. And then I just started watching Maria Collis all the time. And but um, it was also a surprise because I just thought I was going to do Verity all the time. I was always told that I was Aida. But I found that it's more to me than Aida, hmm. you know. And not that I don't love her, not that I don't love singing her, but it's other things that this voice can do, you know. Don't, don't put me in a box. Mm, that's a great point. Um, are there challenges outside that box that you would like to tackle? Um, it's always the acting. I never mm. thought of myself as an actress, but Tosca really did teach me that I am because she's so temperamental. You know, one minute she's loving all over Cavro Dossi, and all of this stuff. And then the next thing you know, she's hollering at him and, you know, and then she kills Scarpia. I mean, you know, that's just in the span of an hour. She done went through all of that. But I was able to pull it off, you know, and I was like, mm. <laughs> but I, I love the challenge of that. Tosca, I think when I was studying her, was the first opera that I went to, like, it's a movie script. Mm -hmm. I can't look at the music first. I, I really had to read through the libretto first yeah. to figure, like, how can I make this believable? Because Aida is a little more passive, 
you know, she don't she doesn't really get to come out until Ritorna Vincitor or the scene with her father. It's just like you know, a couple of specific places. Tosca, it's like, if you, especially if you've never seen the opera before, you don't know when she's gonna pop off. You know, so you just sitting there waiting. Oh, oh, she, she about to go off, she, she about to go off. You know, <laughs> so it was nice to have that challenge. Yeah, so every opera that I do, I look forward to how can I make it not only believable to the audience that I sing for, but it's first got to be believable to me. Can I believe in the notes I'm singing? It's never really, you know, can I sing the notes? It's can I believe in the notes? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Can I believe in what I'm about to give you? Because if I don't, you'll see it. You mm -hmm. will, and I'll feel it, and then it'll be horrible. <laughs> so there we are. It's so <laughs> interesting that with Tosca, you feel like you need to sink into that libretto first before the music even. Mm -hmm. Do you, have you found that with any other roles you've played or operas that you've needed to tackle? Not as much as Tosca. Usually, mm -hmm. as I said, I, I started learning music by ear. So usually the music sticks with me first. Mm -hmm. I can learn it fast, it'll stay. But with Tosca, I just knew it, had, it was a challenge to me. Even when my agent called me and said, you're going to sing this role or they want you to sing this role, I, I knew that that was like another step for me because I can get all the other stuff a little bit more easier, mm -hmm. but Tosca needed something different. She is an actress. So, um, but I learned from her to study my librettos more for other operas mm. that I, I go when I go, even when I return to Aida or I return to Donanna, I look at the libretto first. What more can I give to the music that I already know? I perform these roles enough. The music's already there, but what more can I do to, to feel these notes or to make you feel these notes and these characters and what they're going through, you know, and to live with them more, think about them more. That sounds like such a delicious process. Um, so you've mentioned, you know, you've played Aida a couple times. So what role have you played the most? Is it Aida? Aida. Yeah. Yeah. And what do you think, is there anything new you've learned about her along the way each time you've performed her new perspectives of it? Yeah, she's hard. She is the epitome of vocal, or at least for me, of vocal just everything. If I can sing her, I can sing anything. I recently did Aida in Fort Worth. I was very pleased with my performances there and it let me know I still got it. I'm in good shape. <laughs> and now I can go on to sing. I'm doing Donanda in Japan in June. Um, you know, I, I, I can sing anything after her. But what I've, what I've learned, I think, uh, after doing Tosca actually, as I said before, how to make, how to, delve into the character of Aida even more. You know, as I said, she is kind of passive and you can kind of tell it's just certain places in the opera, the scene with her father. I think that's where I get to do my most acting. You know, a padre, padre, or patria, patria, and, and you know, telling my father, you know, I'm in love with Rodimus and you know, all of this pressure is put on me to uphold and uplift the country. You know, that's the scene where I really get to be a Tosca, if you will. So I, I try to incorporate that more into Aida because it's easy to, you know, because uh, I think, well, at least for me, you can get lost in the singing and trying to place everything right, but not allowing her character to flow through because she is very passionate. Mm -hmm. She's different from Tosca in that Aida uh, keeps her composure in places where Tosca wouldn't. And Aida has to, because unlike Tosca, Aida get killed if she speaks up. Mm -hmm. You know, the second act where she tells I'm Naris, you know, I'm just like you, she almost lets it out that, you know, I'm a princess of Ethiopia. I'm, I'm at the same level as you are. And she had to stop that because it could mean death for not only her, but her, all her people. You know, so it's it's a fine line with Aida. That's something that I've really um, honed in on, if mm -hmm. you will, of how to play that and to believe in that more and to portray that to my audiences that hear me do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and what what do you do? You have a, a routine 
that you do to help kind of dive into a new part or a new production? It's not just a new production, it's any production. It's before any, even rehearsals or before any performance. I have to go out in nature. Um, recently, when I was in Fort Worth, before any performance and even on my days off, there was this park I found and it was a saving grace. And I'd go there in the mornings when it was cool. I'd go there in the evenings at sunset. Um, they'd have a, a creek that run through there and had a waterfall and I'd sit by that. I'd listen to some gospel music or some soul music, pray, think, uh, process stuff, think about even little things like, why did I do that? Why did I say that? I mean, I, I'm an overthinker. <laughs> Just get everything out. Talk to my closest friends or family members, you know, all of that. And uh, that's something that I have to do. And then when I get to the venue, I like to arrive really, really early, usually an hour or two before call time. And uh, I just like to sit in my room and be quiet. I, I don't want any music going. I don't want any, not to be rude. Uh, I just, you know, as a lead singer, you know, usually I do title roles. Everybody is always at your dressing room. They want to talk to you about your hair or your costume or the coaches will come in and want to give you notes on the music or the Italian or the French or German or whatever language I'm singing in. And I want to have some peace and quiet before all that comes. Because once it starts, like a good 30 minutes before curtain, it doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. And I don't have a chance to even process it all. Sometimes I don't even know how I remember certain things. You know, it's just like my brain just, I guess it just, locks into, oh, it's, they tell me all this information, just suck it up, you know. <laughs> I just did that on, uh, everybody in the world on Skype was going to see that. But, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, I just, nature, peace and quiet, time to um, pray and center myself and be around people that I know truly love me. Mm -hmm. And that helps me get out on stage every night. Mm. Mm -hmm. I'm... I'm hearing a, a common thread, you know, you, you sort of, as a child, when you were singing in the closet, you were mm -hmm. kind of um, with yourself for that and, and, you know, finding those times to be in nature and focus, mm -hmm. um, that finding that time to center yourself with just yourself mm -hmm. or with the close people around you is really important. And, you know, that can be a very different uh, experience for a performer when they're in a production with all of those people you just mentioned and a cast and everybody um, compared to recital work. Mm -hmm. And you do both. So how, how do those experiences feel the, similar, the same or different for you, recital work versus productions? Um, productions and recital work feel the same in that I prepare for them the same way, as you said. I, I, and I don't mind being by myself for the most part. I think I need that too. I guess I'm an introvert. I need to rejuvenate in order to give to people. Secondly, the difference is just, I think, with the audiences. In a production, like if I'm singing on a huge stage somewhere, or a Chicago Lyric or something, I don't, uh, I don't really see the audience because mm -hmm. the lights, like now, mm -hmm. they're shining in my face. I can't really see anybody. But in recitals, it's more of an intimate space and I have grown, I guess, in my confidence that I like to make eye contact with people when I sing. You know, I like to find somebody that I can pinpoint for certain phrases, you know, and to let them know or I want to connect, you know. I mean, that's the whole point that we come to performances. We want to feel a connection. People are speaking something that we've been through. I want you to know that I know. You know, so mm -hmm. that's the only thing. And I, it, I think it's maybe all together it's the same. It's just the size is mm -hmm. different. Because I think I can do the same thing in an opera house too. You know, even though, even at the Met, sometimes looking out, it's like looking into an abyss. I'm not going <laughs> to see everybody. But I can just look at a point. But I know it's somebody sitting there because it's 4,000 seats in that house, you know. And it's almost... Uh, I forget how many it is at Chicago Lear, but that's a huge house too. Mm -hmm. San Francisco. I'm, I'm sure I locked eyes with somebody. Mm -hmm. I just didn't know. <laughs> you know. So I'm, um, I, I look forward to... Uh, it, it's funny. I, I, I am an introvert, but at the same time, 
I I love intimacy as well. So mm-hmm. yeah, that's why I'm crazy. <laughs> Leave me alone. But don't go too far. <laughs> Um, well, that's interesting about the scale of, of the houses that you're in. Um, what are some of your favorite houses you've been in? I can't think of any one that hasn't been my favorite. Oh. Everywhere I sing is going to be my favorite because, you know, I want to give my best and people are coming to see and hear me and I want to give them what I got at that time. So, um, I mean, if we're talking like acoustics or, or something or... Um, yeah, the Met, of course, is special to me because that's, you know, I came up in there. Um, Chicago Lyric was a wonderful experience because, first off, I never thought I'd seen Tosca. They gave me that opportunity, and then they allowed me to debut in their house, and they treated me like a queen while I was there. Um, San Francisco as well. Um, I was supposed to do Hernani. I was going to be Elvira, and, of course, COVID shut all that down, but... They remembered me and called me back to do a dialogue of the Carmelites, uh, Madame Lidouan. And even there, they never failed to let me know how happy they were to have me there after, you know, everything been through. And I must say, they were the ones or one of the few opera houses that they paid me half my fee that I would have gotten if I had done um, Ernani. Mm-hmm. And that kept me afloat during COVID when I lost all of my work, Mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, they, they've been very good to me, but, um, those are some that stand out. Um, Royal Opera House in London, I was supposed to have sung there too, and they helped me out during COVID as well. So I I don't know. I don't think I have one particular favorite. It's just, y'all, I'm just glad to be singing in anybody's (laughs) house. Now I'll I'll come sing at your house. I don't know. Y'all got some chicken or something. (laughs) I would happily really, cook just, for you. <laughs> I mean, seriously, after 2020 and uh, having that year where I really wasn't singing, I couldn't even go anywhere to practice, I'm very grateful to be back where I am. Mm-hmm. I've suffered for it in some ways and uh, lost some things, but um, or I felt like I lost some things, but I'm regaining them. But yeah, that was a tough year. And I know everybody can look back and say that was a rough year. But from a personal perspective, that was a very tough year. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be singing in anybody's house. Everybody's house is my favorite house. <laughs> <laughs> everybody's house is your favorite house. Every um, role is your favorite role. <laughs> yeah, I mean, seriously, I'm not trying to yeah. be diplomatic. It's, I think that's, or that's the way I work. I have to love what I'm doing. You know, it's like I said, the Hermit songs, I didn't like those songs at first. But then when I delve deeper into them... That's my childhood, or even Knoxville, somewhere in Knoxville. That's my childhood. It has become that time of evening where people, you know, that that's what my family does. When they get off work, what we do? We go sit on the porch and stare at everybody. (laughs) (laughs) You know, know, just I I have to love what I'm doing because if I don't like it, you're going to see it. And then you'll be like, why did I even bother coming to hear this girl? You know, so, yeah, everything that I'm doing is my favorite at that time. And it'll, and then it'll come back around and it'll be my favorite again. Mm-hmm. You know, right now, um, I'm, I'm about to sing uh, Donana in Japan. That's my favorite role right now. And then when I come back to Aida or um, Tosca, that'll, she'll be my favorite mm-hmm. again. You know, my mom always said I had a one-track mind. That can be a bad thing at times because I can't multitask to save my life. But trying to focus on something to get somewhere, it's a great thing to have because you can't let anything else get in the way. So when I'm doing a role, that's my favorite. I'm not thinking about Tosca if I'm singing Donana. I'm not thinking about Aida if I'm singing Donana. I'm thinking about Donana. I'm in love with her. What can I do to bring her about and make her real? And how can I make it more realistic, you know? And how can, she's a character. I'm sorry, I'm going off subject. No, no, maybe, go ahead. But she's a character. She's one, like, how do you decide? Did she really like being with Don Giovanni when he tried to rape her? Did he really go through with it? Did she enjoy it? You know, I mean, seriously, it's a lot that you can do with her. So it's, it's you know, I dedicate myself to those things. I can't think about anything else. 
<laughs> oh, I, no, that makes sense. I think the 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 focus and and drive that you put into it and the passion you put into it is clearly what is putting you on this trajectory that that you've mm-hmm. been on. Um, have there been any projects that you've worked on, productions or other kinds of projects that have been that have just carried a really special significance for you personally? Mm-hmm. Um. Things I've done at the Met have been very special, just because I never, I really never thought I'd be on that stage. And even getting into the Lindemann program, it was like a, a blur for me. Like I, you know, oh, uh, I'm here. <laughs> you know, really meeting James Levine, Marilyn Horn, you know, people I'd heard of in college. My Mr. Smith told me about them. I really never thought I'd be there. Um, Special things to me that really stick out, though, uh, of course, doing Liu at the Met, um, and that happened. Someone had gotten sick, and I needed to jump in for that. Um, doing uh, La Forza del Destino in Frankfurt, just because it was, uh, I had a hard time out there, but I think I, I did some of my best singing out there, and I'm not trying to gloat on myself. I don't ever do that, but... I was shown up singing out there. I sang the hell out of that. Excuse me. I sang that piece. Uh, second, uh, second, third, fourth, whatever I'm on. Tosca in Chicago was very special because I never in a million years thought I'd sing that role. And I didn't know that I'd even get to that house. And then to do it with Russell Thomas, of all people, you know, he's very sweet. And uh, I think we did well on stage together. And I really just followed his lead. But... Um, yeah, doing that role, that was really, really special to me. And uh, I, I have to say, I felt like a diva. That was the first time I felt like a diva. People want to call me that, and I don't really, don't really register, but Tosca is a diva. <laughs> and to that second act, I put that gown on, and I got those gloves and this jewelry and the crown. You couldn't tell me nothing. So yeah, that, that, was, <laughs> that was special. <laughs> And San Diego, too. I, they, oh, I had such wonderful dresses, both productions in Chicago and San Diego. It's Tosca. Once I get that second act gown on, <laughs> y'all have to stop me from walking out the opera house in that gown. <laughs> Shoot, I knew I was cute. Shoot, baby mama, wifey, whatever. I'd be somebody something in that gown. <laughs> And uh, so you, you were talking earlier, too, about um, how supportive your family was mm-hmm. when, when you were first finding your voice and everything. Um, and I think I, I think I had learned that you also spent quite a bit of time with them back in Kentucky during COVID. Mm-hmm. So uh, are your family opera lovers? They are now. They are now. Mm-hmm. You converted them. Fantastic. Um, what, you know, this is, of course, something that we in the opera industry are always talking about is how do we find new audiences? How do we show people how great it can be to just love opera as much as everybody in this industry does? Um, what do you think, I, obviously, they came to opera for you. Um, what, what do you think kind of got to them about, about what they could really love about opera and what could other opera companies take from that about how to really resonate with people? Well, the first thing, of course, they came from me. My family first came to New York uh, to hear me do one of the Cretan ladies in uh, Idomeneo. Maestro James Levine was conducting. I had a small part, but my family was all in. They all went on. And my sister-in-law, Lord have mercy, she's like just number one fan. I mean, ride or die. She's like, are we coming? We are coming. And it was like, okay, Lisa, just calm down. I'm on stage for like two minutes. But she, you know, she gathered up my cousins, everybody. They rented a van. <laughs> they, were, <laughs> they were all there. But I think outside of me just being on the stage, I think they were introduced to another world. And to see somebody that looked like them doing that, too. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I, even when I was in Fort Worth, I had a lot of young African-American singers from the chorus coming up to me like it's good to see more of us on stage you know Mm -hmm. I think it was that and just being introduced to another world you know Uh, a lot of operas especially with Verity 
are taken from literature. Verdi loved Shakespeare. You know, we have Falstaff, and, uh, Macbeth, you know, you, you, you're inspired by reading. And so, you know, just knowing that there's more to just sitting in front of the TV and not to knock the musicians that are out today because I, I ain't gonna lie, I love me some Cardi B and Beyonce and Rihanna, I wanna jam. I like my trap music when I'm riding down the freeway in my Cadillac. But, <laughs> but also, I, I, if anything, I would love to introduce young people, not just young African Americans, anybody, this generation that's coming up, that it's more than rap music and pop music. You know, it's, it's more out there. It's a whole other life. It's a history. You know, it's history that we're learning about through opera. The, a lot of these operas that I'm singing, these things happen. Or the places were real. Tosca, that place was real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Idomeneo, all these Greek tragedies. It's stuff that they're or supposed to be learning in school. Mm -hmm. And it's just music being put to it. Mm -hmm. I think, if anything, um, what I must say, I like the idea of broadcasting. I like that COVID has brought that out more. Even now, you know, things are being... Uh, what do you call it, Skyped and put over the internet. People don't have to leave the house. So that means if you can't leave, you can just sit at home and watch it, mm -hmm. you know, or people can watch it on their phones, which is what a lot of young people do now. Anyway, everything is on your phone. I think continuing in that manner mm -hmm. can reach people. Um, I'm more of a, traditional, a traditionalist, if I may be honest. So um, like Tosca, the production of that, Aida, keeping it, you know, to the libretto and allowing people to see, you know, uh, Ethiopia mm -hmm. and Egypt and uh, the cathedrals of Italy and things like that, to keep it that way, just to allow them to see what that time period was like. And then we can go into other things if you want to, or more contemporary. I think those two things, mm -hmm. staying traditional, um, using the internet, even more um yeah um and i think also it's like what they say it takes a village probably reaching the parents as well i used to teach school when i lived in houston texas and uh, i i my failures were when the parents were not um on my side or you know they couldn't see the benefit of what i was giving their children I, I remember, I won't name anything, but I was teaching at a school where, you know, being an engineer or a scientist or a lawyer or a doctor was valued. Not that that's wrong, but that music was completely just like, you know, I was just there to babysit. And that's not the thing. Music is a profession as well. It is. And it's, it's not that I get out there and song and dance and tap and sing for people. It takes a lot of mental work for me to get out on that stage for people you know, or practicing, you know, an instrument or even my voice. So um, teaching students that too and incorporating music, I mean, real music in our schools as well, not just uh, to sit in there and watch videos or watch the Beatles or whoever, not that I don't love the Beatles, but you know, to really teach them, like, you know, you can learn this instrument and to put that time and effort and I, I do think, you know, I think I've reached a few people. And even when I was teaching school, I know that there are a few students that are still uh, into music now because of what they learned with me. I'm for sure of it. Some of my, uh, some of them I kept in touch on Instagram. You know, um, that it just, it's very a very special part of your life. And it's therapeutic too. Mm -hmm. So I think I didn't win all the clip again no, with these questions. But, I, I love hearing all yeah. of that. <laughs> Um, so I, I love the connections that, that people in this industry will have personally to, uh, pop music and other, mm -hmm. other genres of music. And you've, you've talked a little bit about your love of Whitney Houston and, and mm -hmm. Beyonce and Cardi B and all sorts of, of yeah. singers. Um, so, uh, these seem like all, a lot of really important artistic inspirations for you. Mm -hmm. Um, do they ever find their way in when you're, preparing for an opera? In some ways, um, just to be free and to not think about what I'm doing. Because when I think about it, everything just gonna go downhill. So like if I'm 
if I'm coming to the opera house and I have a performance, I want to get there early, I'm riding in the Uber or whatever to get to the venue. Yeah, I listen to Beyonce. Mm -hmm. I listen to her and she's always about empowerment and loving yourself. Mm -hmm. So yeah, she puts me in a good mood. Or I listen to Cardi B. But then when I'm singing, if I feel a little bit more, free, well, never delve away from the music or the what the composer wants, but just to have that type of energy. You know, I like to, uh, when I'm not singing opera, I love to sing karaoke. I love going to karaoke bars. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I want to do is Whitney Houston or Selena or um, Mariah Carey, just to sing, just to have fun, not think about it, not be judged, not to be having some critics out there trying to tell me how to do my job and they can't even sing. I don't even want to do that, just to have fun at that. And when I've done an opera for a really long time, like Aida, or even Tosca now, she's lived with me for a while, I can kind of let it go. And, I'm, and even though I'm singing the notes that are on the page and what the conductor, or what, the, uh, what Puccini or Verdi wanted, I can put a little bit of that church girl from Polk Memorial into it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, well, I know we only have a couple minutes left, so mm -hmm. to I just wanted to finish up by asking you about your next project. You mentioned you're preparing for Donana in Japan. Mm -hmm. um, what else do you have coming up? Um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to talk oh, about okay. it just yet, okay. but I do have things that I'm looking very forward to in the future, um, some of which include master classes and teaching. <laughs> so I'm going to try to tell people how to sing, I guess. You know, y'all can come if you want to. No, but um, I, I'll do my best. Um, but, yeah, I, I have some of those and um, even some more Aida in mm -hmm. my future. And, you know, I'm just, just y'all, as long as I keep singing, and then I won't die. So there we go. <laughs> I just, you know, and I meant that any, any house is fine. I'll come to your house, you know, as long as I'm singing. <laughs> well, Michelle, thank you so much for taking time to share <laughs> all of your great <laughs> insights with us. And uh, thank you all for joining us and for joining us from home and for supporting the Women's Opera Network Mentorship Program at Opera America. Thank you so much. Thank you.